Hi, everyone. This is Annie Rogers. And on behalf of the Attitude team, I am pleased to welcome you to today's ADHD Experts presentation titled Building a College Readiness Timeline for Teens with ADHD. Leading today's presentation is Laura Barr. Laura is an experienced college consultant. She has propelled the educational journey of thousands of students from cradle to college. Her expertise stems from decades spent as an educator, administrator, writer, and instructional coach. Laura holds a Master of Education in Early Childhood and Elementary Education, a Certified Education Planner credential, and a Certificate in Curriculum and Instruction for Student-Centered Coaching. So in today's webinar, we will explore the skills that teens need as they begin applying for and heading to college. The transition to college is exciting and very worrisome, especially if your child has ADHD. Your teen may need tailored support. And even then, knowing when they're ready to fly solo can feel like guesswork. Today, Laura will explain how to build a clear, flexible roadmap for your child by first pinpointing their areas for growth. We would like to begin today's webinar by asking two poll questions to our live audience to get a sense of who you are and what you need. Number one, um, where is your child right now in their college timeline? And then secondly, how engaged and motivated is your child to tackle the college application and the, the preparation work ahead? Um, please give us a sense of, of what you're dealing with. Um, just select your answers. You can always comment in the text box under the video player to tell us more. And if you're looking for um, common answers to webinar questions about slides, transcripts, certificates of attendance, just click on the FAQ tab on your webinar screen. If you support the work we're doing here at Attitude, please visit attitudemag.com slash subscribe and sign up for Attitude Magazine for yourself or to share with someone who could benefit from greater ADHD understanding. Just click the uh, magazine tab on your screen to learn more. And finally, the sponsor of today's webinar is Landmark College. Landmark College offers summer programs to assist a wide range of students with learning differences, including rising high school juniors and seniors, recent high school graduates, and students enrolled at other colleges. Students learn specific strategies to be successful in formal academic settings and grow personally and academically in an international and supportive academic community. Click the link on your screen or visit landmark.edu slash summer to learn more. Attitude thanks our sponsors for supporting these free webinars. Sponsorship has no influence on speaker selection or webinar content. So without any further ado, I'm so pleased to welcome Laura Barr. Laura, thank you so much for joining us today and for leading this discussion on what is a very daunting and important topic. <laughs> I thank you so much for the kind introduction, and I'm so happy to be back on Attitude. Uh, Annie introduced me as Lara Barr, and I'm just thrilled to be here. I'm the owner and founder of Emerging Educational Consulting. We provide one-to-one -one mentorship for students from the beginning to the end of the application process. And we created our process really with students with ADHD in mind. We used a curriculum philosophy called universal design, which created a step-by-step -step process with the hope that the process itself would empower students and families, but also really raise good humans along the way. And that is why I wake up every day is to raise citizens who will transform our society, and we need that more than ever. And we especially need ADHD brains more than ever, because while we all know that there are so many challenges, there are so many strengths. 
So uh, Annie did a good job of talking about my credentials. The one thing she didn't mention is that my honorary PhD is that I am the mother of four neurodiverse kids. <laughs> so I can assure you, I have so much empathy about this process. And the reason I wanted to, um, the reason I created this webinar was I wanted to reach as many parents as possible to be able to share what I have learned both as a parent and also as an educational support planner over all of these years. So my kids are now in their 20s. They all live independently. They have jobs of their own. And I was teasing before with the team I had before I was saying they also have their Netflix and Amazon Prime accounts, which I might have to add to the checklist at some point. So I'm just delighted to be here today. Let's review the agenda real quick. Um, let's see. Let's see if I can get this. Here we go. Okay, today we're going to talk a little bit about maintaining perspective through this process. We're gonna talk about what is launch anyway. We're going to assess our current launch status with our students. We're gonna have a playful workshop together. I'm gonna to offer some strategies to help you strengthen and your students strengthen their own autonomy. And then we're gonna talk about the unique challenges and solutions to college prep. And then the idea either today or later is for you to really have an opportunity to create some SMART goals for yourself along the way. So I, I like to start these webinars with this idea of keeping the end in mind. I have attended many webinars as a parent and I have filled out hundreds of checklists for my kids. And often I leave those events feeling sometimes less than or overwhelmed. I do not want you to do that today. I want you to withhold self-judgment. There's gonna be some people who will feel really confident about where they are in the process and some people who will feel like maybe they haven't started. All of it's okay. So another reminder, people ask me all the time, what is the timeline? Of course there's a timeline, but with students with ADHD, we have to give ourselves permission to be flexible and adaptable about that timeline. There is not one path for all students. Yes, the hope is for many of us that our children will be college bound. I have a daughter, Olivia, who did not go to college and I am so proud of what she has accomplished. There are trades, there are gap years, there are transitions to job, there is doing college later. All of those, give yourself permission that all of those things could be a possibility. Your child will grow up, I promise. I'm, I, I cannot believe I have four kids in their 20s. One is about to turn 30, as a matter of fact. So it's inevitable time is on our side. <laughs> um, also remembering that everyone's doing the best they can. As parents, we're doing the best we can. Our students are doing the best we can. And having that strengths-based approach always serves everyone in this process. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt says, comparison is the thief of joy. One of the hardest things I think um, we have to do as parents is to withhold this idea that we, our student is going to do what our neighbor is doing or the cousin is doing or even the other sibling, what they are doing. And everyone has the right to their own path. All right, let's talk about what is launch anyway. Launching for me refers to the process of preparing a teenager from adulthood and guiding them into an independent, self-sufficient life. I love the graphic that we're looking at. And for those of you who are listening on the podcast, what we're looking at is a letter V with an arrow from the bottom that goes straight to the top. The idea being the V at the bottom is that early childhood period where our children's needs are being met. The lines on the side represent the boundaries that parents, boundaries and expectations that we create as parents from the beginning of early childhood to the launch. The launch being the top of the V where we have this wide space 
and the arrow being at the top that they're launched into the world between, I use launch between 18 and 25, as we know more about the brain, we know that sometimes the brain doesn't develop as quickly for some as others. And especially our students with ADHD, sometimes their timeline for brain development is just different. And so they do need more time in this process. So when we think about the challenges that we face, it's, you know, it's like, how many more times do we need to go through the challenges? Because we know them. <laughs> but I think it's good to set context for the goals that we set today. We know that the presentation of ADHD in teens starts with this idea of difficulty of sustaining attention. Students struggle to maintain focus during classes and homework while studying organizational challenges, organizing tasks, managing time, keeping track of assignments and deadlines can be particularly challenging. And the reason I'm going through this is because it's a really good reminder that teenage years are sometimes really complicated with students with ADHD because the game is getting harder and harder and harder to play. And they have to manage so many pieces and college is another up level of these things. So while I'm talking about how the presentation shows in teens, I'm reminding us that this is the source of where we're going to set goals so that we can help empower them by the time they get to college so they have a strong plan on these challenges. Impulsiveness, impulsivity can lead to difficult difficulties in decision-making, potentially leading to rushed or poorly thought out choices. Social challenges, interacting with peers and adults in school setting requires attention and impulse control. And sometimes that doesn't always go so well with our teens. Emotional regulation, ADHD can affect students' ability to regulate their emotions, leading to frustration, anxiety, lack, lack of confidence. So, so many of us know that these are the things that we face. Where we see challenges in college come specifically around this idea that students who self-advocate and can transition to college need to be able to advocate for themselves. Because while those challenges still may exist, when students can take a stand and ask for what they need, there are so many options for students to get that help and support. That's where we can bridge that gap. We're really looking for that increased independence. College requires a higher degree of independence and self-management. One of the questions that I saw that was asked is, what is the stats on students who have ADHD and their success in college? One of the stats that I found is between 35 and 40% of students who start college will actually withdraw after their first year of college due to some of these challenges. But the, what we also see is the main reason and the things those students had in common was emotional regulation and organizational challenges and life skills. So you'll see a lot of the things I talk about today are some of those life skills. So my belief is, is that if we can bridge that gap and start in high school, practicing what they need in college, that we can really help support that transition. Academic rigor um, is something that I think a lot of all of students feel, especially our kids who have experienced the COVID um, year gap. There's a little bit of gap in some of those academics. So the increased academic demands on college can really overwhelm students with ADHD. So making sure we build in supports and services through their 504, IEP, their accommodation plans can be a really good way to bridge that gap. Transitioning to a new environment, that's hard for anyone. Adapting to a new environment, establishing new routines, and managing more complex schedules can be particularly challenging for students with ADHD. One of the things that I speak to in this is that students don't have to be in school all day long when they go to college. So all the time, all of a sudden, these students have all of this time on their hands. And unless there's a plan to manage that time, it can sometimes feel really out of, out of students can feel very out of sorts, not knowing how to manage it. And then finally, just self-care management, the responsibility for managing medication, appointments, and overall health um, can sometimes be 
a big issue for these students. All right, this is the fun part. We're going to workshop. Anybody who knows me knows I love for you to do the heavy lifting and the thinking. So I am going to present for you 20 different skills that I designed based on what I have evaluated as the most important launch ready skills. What I want you to do is to think about your student and their own kind of status quo. That is our goal today. If you want to, you can pull out a piece of paper or if you have um, a note app on your phone. Also, if you're just listening or you're you know, in the car, just listen and enjoy the, the, the 20 different skills. At the end of our session today, we're gonna have a QR code and access for you to download our launch worksheet that has all of the skills, all of the strategies and a way for you to evaluate and set some SMART goals. So at each of these skills that I'm mention, gonna mention, you have the opportunity to rate your student's progress between a one and a three. One meaning not yet. Notice I say not yet. <laughs> On our way is number two and three is achieving because with any of these, some days are better than others, even for us as adults. Remember the no judgment rule. Please do not feel overwhelmed. There might be some of you who will be like, I don't have one of these. That's okay. That is okay. Note, there are many different inventories and checklists available. This is a qualitative assessment. There are psychologists who have life skill assessments that are quantitative. We are gonna provide you some resources to some other checklists that I really like that you can um, assess as well. So this is just mine, Lara Bar's version. <laughs> All right, let's Go d dive in. We're going to cycle through four different categories, personal, academic, career, and college readiness. And I'm just going to kind of read them off and you can either listen or start the process of, let's see, I'm pressing next and it is not cooperating. So let's see. There we go. All right. Personal awareness. One, student recognizes and utilizes their sense of self-efficacy, is aware of their learning style, personality traits, and can articulate their strengths and areas for growth. So you can go ahead and think, gosh, is my student, do they know who they are? Do they know their learning style? Two, student has established sleep routines, Supporting physical and mental health manages their own wake and sleep cycles. Um, once upon a time in 2015, I wrote a book called The Entitlement Antidote. And it was a, a book that I, um, an ebook that I designed with this idea that if we could create just the smallest of skills early on, then we could empower these students to launch. And sleep was a big deal for me. I was a big fan of even in kindergarten, students having their own alarm clocks. So that idea of like, we need to, our kids need to be waking themselves up if they're gonna go to college. <laughs> Three, students take the initiative in making their healthcare appointments, including doctor, dentist, and haircuts. If you remember the V shape and you remember in the middle, by the time students are 16 is when I really like students to start taking initiative of making their own doctor's appointments and dentist appointments. Sometimes obviously parents need to be close by, but the students are the ones making those calls. Students have obtained their driver's license by the time they are 16 or 17 or are proficient in using public transportation. Again, another one that we might want to see um, around that age, 16, 17, if they're not going to get a driver's license, then can they get around and transport themselves? Number five, students demonstrate financial literacy with their bank account and understand how to use debit or credit cards. Here in Colorado, we have a children's bank, and so students can get credit cards and bank accounts pretty young, like 13. I know my son Devin ended up going with an account here where he had to be 16 and I had to co-sign. So getting used to using um, their credit cards, managing money, being able to have conversations about who's paying for what. 
Number six, student manages screen time responsibly and behaves ethically on social media. Seven, student is informed about laws regarding sexual consent, as well as the dangers of pornography, drug, and alcohol use. This is a big one. This is really overwhelming. Um, I know that students who have been diagnosed with ADHD sometimes have more impulsive or self-medicating behavior and having conversations at a young age and making sure everybody feels comfortable about having those difficult conversations can be really helpful. Moving towards college, understanding Title IX's significance in education and personal welfare is very, very important. And I'll come up with, some, I'll give you some strategies on that in a little bit. Let's move to some academic strategies. We call it academic acumen. Number nine, student has proven skills in self-advocacy with teachers and seeks support from communication from counselors. So really thinking about, are your students using their 504 coordinators, their IEP? Are they asking for their 504 um, accommodations that they need? If they're not understanding content, are they meeting with their teachers? Number 10, understands graduation requirements, how to create a course of study that reflects their interests and understands what colleges require. Somebody asked a question ahead of time that I thought was a really great one, which is how do we get kids to prepare for college without making them feel bad or less than. And I think sometimes one of the things that helps is to take the emotion out of it and be like, listen, here's what is required. Here's what colleges are looking for. Here's what your schools requires. Here are the things that you need. And let's choose, what do you, how do you wanna manage this? Instead of making it about the emotion, make it about like what is so. Let's go to 11, student efficiently manages their email, calendars, digital folders, facilitating personal and academic organization. Um, I mean, I'm still working on this. <laughs> so I want everybody to again, take this deep breath, but listen, are they checking their emails? When colleges reps start reaching out, we wanna have a plan for them to be able to check their emails. So creating some kind of systems can be really helpful. 12, student navigates high school portals and tracks their grades with minimal parent parental involvement. Remember that V. This is a gradual release. So what happens in ninth grade might look really different to what's happening in 12th grade. The goal here is to set some expectations and some create some habits so that there is that gradual release because all of this is not going to happen at once. I have become a huge proponent of really having conversations about career visioning. Many of these students are invited into writing statements for colleges that ask them what are they going to major in and having an understanding of what different colleges offer and being able to have an area of interest has become more important than even in the past five years. So we're really looking for student has explored various career paths and can articulate their areas of interest. Career paths and area of interest is not asking them to pick a career. It's just have they had that exploration. 14, student has earned certification skills beyond classroom learning, such as pet sitting, babysitting, lifeguard, CPR, and first aid. I love these certification programs for teenagers at young age. It builds their self-confidence. They're usually short classes that students with ADHD can kind of manage. And then they feel really accomplished that they can put that on their resume. Um, 15 students has engaged in work experiences like camp counseling, babysitting. Maybe they've tried some entrepreneurship jobs in the service industry. 16 students have participated in summer internships, shadow days, community service, volunteers who work and broaden their understanding. Um, some students signing up for college um, camps and programs. There's many different colleges that offer incredible opportunities for students to get on campus. 
student 17. This is so I guess we're switching now from kind of that career to college readiness. So the college readiness list can this starts a whole different list of really a long set of things students have to do to be ready to apply to college, but to get to the point where they're even going to apply, we want to make sure that students are advocating for a school choice that meets their academic, career, mental health, and really the needs that they have. So what kind of college? Is it going to be a college that has incredible supports and services and writing centers? Is it going to be a college only for students who have learning challenges? These are decisions that need to be made. 18, student has experience with independence through camps, has stayed with relatives. Again, maybe some of those college experiences. We want to know that students can um, be away for more than a week or two and have had that experience so that they know what it's like to feel maybe a little homesick or to be away from the comforts of getting woken up in the morning or getting their meals made. Those kinds of experience can be really impactful. 19, student has a solid understanding of potential areas of study, major interests that align with their future and academic career path. That's a little bit different than the one we did before because this is that merging of I know what I'm interested in and then I know that this college offers that program. 20, parents and students have developed an understanding of college finances and have created agreements on allowances, money spent once they get to college. Once students are away from home, students will have their own, um, they'll have their own needs and, and things that they have to purchase. So how's that gonna happen? Is there an endless supply? Is there a budget? How are we gonna practice that? Best to practice it when they're 15, 16, 17, than to start the big program when they go to college. All right, I'm just gonna pause for a second. So if you have your piece of paper or your sheet, if there's anything that you need to do, later today, you'll have the opportunity to be playful and you can kind of score yourself in those areas. Um, the goal is that you have something to leave with where you can first celebrate the areas of strength with your student. And maybe this is something you wanna do with your student um, just the two of you, three of you, four of you, guardians engaging with your student in this conversation. The first thing we want to do when they when we do this is always celebrate the strengths. Like, wow, my student can do this, even if it's one or two things. That is fabulous. Then thinking through each area, that personal academic career and college readiness, and pick one area of focus that you as a parent or you and your student want to work on. And then creating a SMART goal. So we all know our SMART goals, specific, measurable, achievable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. So maybe it's like by summer, a sophomore year, my student will have an alarm clock that will wake them up every day going to school. Or my student will dot, dot, dot. So these kinds of, setting these kinds of goals um, will help fine tune where we want to go towards that launch. When I think about problem solving on these things, I'll have parents say to me, well, my student has their phone in their room. I can't take their phone out or their phone's out. So we don't have an alarm. We often try to use this idea of that design thinking. So why, what, if, and how? In my little entitlement antidote book that I wrote, my whole idea was that why don't parents just do and think the way innovators think. Why we are innovators because we're actually raising a human being. So we don't always have a path to follow, especially us who have students with ADHD that is mainstream. So those parenting books never worked for me. <laughs> I was like, I, I can't get my child to go to bed. And I, it just didn't, those things didn't work for me the way they work for their peers. But when I started thinking out of the box, like, why is this a problem? Maybe it's not even a problem. What if I try this? How are we going to do it? We're going to try this, this, and this. And if that doesn't work, we're going to try something else. And then maybe in the end, it's not something I cared that much to create 
a goal around. So deciding what you want to focus on is going to be really important. And your student deciding, obviously, is going to be the most. When we start thinking about adding new steps or new skills into our students' lives or into our, our children's lives, using the science of habit stacking can be amazing. If you don't know that much about habit stacking, do a Google search because it's amazing. The idea is, listen, if you're already brushing your teeth, then take your medication. If you're already you know, doing one thing, then let's do the other. If you're checking Instagram, check your email to see if college admissions texted you back. <laughs> so those kinds of ideas are really fun ways and students get kind of into it. We use a lot of habit stacking in our, in our, in our program. So creating your plan. The, the ultimate goal here is for you to be able to take some of these and to really move yourself forward towards this idea of launch. All right, so let's go through some strategies. I promised you strategies, so I'm gonna go through these because I really, I'm gonna make sure we have time to answer lots of questions. Um, self-reflection, personal awareness, encouraging regular self-reflection on achievements and challenges to build self-awareness. I cannot tell you the difference between the students we get who have had a lot of practice with self-reflection compared to the students that haven't is enormous. Um, Self-reflection can be really fun just using um, bold and beautiful questions you can find online. You can also find things like um, conversation starters to have on your dinner table. Those are small things that you can do that just help this idea. There's also um, understanding, um, understanding your neuropsych profile can be a really good way to self-reflect. Um, we've talked a lot about sleep, so I won't get into that, but talking a little bit more about this idea of the skills for independence, being able to buy your clothes, use public transportation, have that autonomy um, around choosing their different um, activities, things like that can really support. Financial management, bank accounts, budget, Mint is a great budgeting app they can have on their phone, creating a family economy where there's some rules around how much money people can spend, how much, if they get an allowance, how much money, um, what do they have to buy, use that money for? Maybe it's their own hair products, their own makeup. Those kinds of things can be really supportive. Um, having that open dialogue, talking about uncomfortable things, sensitive topics, using psychologists to help support that, watching workshops, educational workshops can be enormous supportive on our in our parent community which is a free community for all parents we have um, podcasts that we have where we encourage we talk to psychologists title IX experts so that parents have access to this kind of information to promote that success let's see everybody wants to know how I can't get that to, there we go academic so active participation in IEP and 504 plans we talked about, scheduling regular meetings with teachers. Sometimes our students won't just jump right in to having a conversation with their teacher, but if we say, hey, every Thursday, you're gonna make a habit of going to see this one teacher a week. Could be a really fun way to get kids on track. Use a lot, using those check-ins to monitor progress and address concerns. Executive function support. This is another just big one. Starting early with students in that executive function support. Somebody asked me um, before this webinar about the different kinds of study skills needed. We say things like Cornell notes, starting in ninth grade, having Grammarly, having passcode, um, having passcodes um, apps, all of those kinds of organizational uh, systems in Google for their papers, getting those set in ninth grade and having them by the time they're in 12th grade, just second nature is really helpful. Early knowledge and utilization of email folders and tabs using password managers. As far as the tips for career visioning, we are big fans of micro internships. So they are short term professional assignments that allow students to gain hands on experience in their field. Most school counselors have access to internships. And I don't think people use our college counselors in schools enough for these kinds of opportunities. Um, we are big fans in our practice of like, 
let's make resumes and your activities lists and create a LinkedIn account. Ideas around entrepreneur, um, entrepreneurial ideas or taking classes such as cooking, coding, woodworking, fixing bike classes. These have been wonderful avenues for students to build that sense of self-confidence and empowerment. So again, exploring some of those entrepreneurial ventures. Certifications are really exciting. This idea of like starting your own business. I have one of my students is a car detailer. Um, I'm gonna call him this week because in the snow in Colorado, our cars look terrible at the end of the day. So at the end of the month, so I'm like, I'm gonna have him come detail my car. So all of those opportunities that we can provide for students help build them up and also get them some of those career skills that they need. Starting early for college awareness and understanding the timeline. Begin discussing these future goals as early as middle school and building a forward thinking mindset. This is the thing I say all of the time, especially for my students with ADHD. I think a lot of our students procrastinate because they're fearful. Those voices inside of their head, I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, maybe I have ADHD, I can't even organize my life now, how will I do it in the future? But the bottom line is if we can break up those tiny steps over time, we make it so much more doable for them and it just creates a sense of peace starting early. Keeping a dedicated calendar. I think that that's something that can help. I think for C's, for if you have, say, a rising junior right now and really putting out a calendar between now and senior year so they can actually see what the job entails could be a wonderful way to empower them. Visiting colleges early, getting kids on college campuses, I think are really important. I think sometimes it can create this internal motivation so they can see what's coming in the future. Engaging in campus tours, there's on online opportunities, and approach the applications as any other project, breaking things down into the smallest pieces into manageable, manageable tasks with deadlines, goals, and outcomes. For those of you who are gonna do this without supported help, I think that is probably one of the most helpful things you can do is think about this as a project, like a giant work project, and having it built out on some kind of project management system will help so much. So I think this idea of using the access that you have to any kind of asana, base camp project management, um, creating a project just maybe even on a Google document where students can see what they have and then checking those boxes off one at a time can would be really, really helpful. Okay, I'm getting to the point where we're getting to questions. So um, I'm a big quote person. So my Mark Twain quote, the secret of getting ahead is getting started. The secret of getting started is breaking your complex, overwhelming tasks into small, manageable tasks, and then just starting with the first one. So that is my goal for you, that today you have something, one thing you can start with that will help you get to that point where you do not have to pay for your child's Prime account and Netflix accounts. <laughs> All right, couple things before we start. Um, this is the QR code for you to use to access so that you can download the worksheet and you can begin working with your student and set those goals. There are multiple opportunities to, and you will have this, I believe, so I'm not gonna go through all of these, although I'll flip through them quickly just to make sure. Um, this is a copy of the Entitlement Antidote. If you're interested in copying that, I wrote it 2015. It hasn't been edited since. <laughs> it has some early stories about raising my son, Christopher, which gives me a chuckle all the time because he is now 25 with a fancy job and he gets a paycheck. He actually has a 401k. So, and let me tell you, he gave me a run for my money um, as a student with ADHD in high school and college. So we also have a timeline. If you want to download the timeline to the college application process, you can download that. And again, all of this is going to be um, given to you at some point. If you want to connect with us, looks like that one 
it's not showing up. So I think I will just, oh, it's just, there we go. All right. I think I'm just going to dive right into the questions. I'm ready. Amazing. Laura, thank you so much. Um, before we start the Q&A, I will quickly thank Lang Landmark College once more for sponsoring today's webinar. And I will refer back to the survey that everyone took at the outset here. Um, it does seem like our audience is almost half um, parents of juniors and seniors in high school. Oh, so great. those who are really staring dead into the eyes of, of college, um, which is, which is helpful to know. And on the motivation scale, it seems like our students are around four, four and a half, 10 being extremely motivated. So there is, there is hope there a hundred percent. Um, and you've given us a lot of resources to get started with. So, um, I'm going to start with this question, which is popping up quite a bit here. Um, ADHD, as we know, runs in families, a lot of caregivers here who obviously by being here are motivated to help their students and they are feeling so overwhelmed with all of <laughs> the work ahead. Um, you suggested breaking things up where for, let's just say, um, the parent of a student who is a rising junior, um, what would be like three next steps for them to get going here and kind of get over some of this overwhelm? I would say one of the things I would want for these parents is to build a relationship as soon as you can with your college counselor at your school. Every school has a college counselor. Some are more helpful than others, but I think this idea of like, I want to start early and I need support and a timeline so that I can begin this process would be extremely helpful. And I'd like to set up monthly meetings. I think having that mentor would be so helpful, but let's just also make the assumption that that counselor's not available, which is more and more common these days, sadly, because I think a lot of these counselors are overworked, not because they're not amazing humans or and want to be helpful. But I would say um, download our timeline because that gives you a checklist right off the top, right off the bat. Download our checklist and then break them down in order, right? So do I want to take an SAT or ACT? Do I have I created a course of study that aligns with well, only what my school needs for graduation, but I can research a couple colleges in my maybe my state and see what is it that they require and maybe go on a college visit down the street from where you live. Those kinds of things I think would help propel. And then really, if you have the opportunity to just create a note app and just put those down and then put a date next to the different tasks and just one by one. I think where we, for our juniors and seniors, it's the essays that I worry most about because they're the most important. And any child who's going to have a 10 colleges on their list is probably going to have 10, 10 to 12 prompts that they're going to have to answer. So even for me, it's like by our juniors, we like to say by junior year, you're going to have two prompts written by the holiday time. By April, you're going to have four. By May, you're going to have five. Personal statement is going to be in June, right? So really just making that checklist. And if you can't do it by yourself, don't be afraid to ask for help. There are people all over the country who do this for a living like me. So it's like, we don't be afraid to ask for help to take some of the burden off you. Now, obviously those are fee-based and not everybody can pay that, which is why you want to use your college counselor. Okay. That's very helpful. I feel like uh, prioritizing those three steps gives some um, next steps to a lot of folks here. Um, and I did want to just reiterate for those of you who are asking about the resources that Laura provided, um, you will receive all of those links after the webinar wraps up as well. So 
Do not worry about having missed a QR code. Um, you will get the timeline as well as the checklist of, of skills um, and goal setting to work on with your student. And um, I also just wanted to, to stress this point. A lot of people asking, should I sit down and review the list of skills in the various areas that you went over today with the, the one to three ratings? Should they sit down with their students um, and discuss all of those skills? I, I think it could be one of the most impactful things a parent could do with their students because it also takes that, it's back to that whole idea of like, how do we, how do I work with a student who maybe has, and this is common, some of the students we work with, like, they're like, they think they've got it nailed. <laughs> they're like, I'm going to go to this school and that school, but they have straight C's and they're not getting their work in. And there's a big disconnect between their big ideas and what's actually happening. And the thing is, is that we don't want to make our students feel bad or to feel like, but we also have the responsibility as parents to make sure they understand that their abilities and their um, line up with what is being asked of them from some of these colleges. And so what is sometimes nice is to take the emotion out. And when you take the emotion out, you say, hey, I just did this workshop today and I want to invite us into going through this and you can do it on your own or we can do it together. But I'd love for you to rate like these are what people say are really good things for us to have by the time you go to college. And that taking that away from parents saying you're not doing these things makes that student begin to have that self-efficacy, which is what I think that's the number one on the list, right? And I, I think there's a lot of students who don't even know what Title IX is, but man, by the time these ADHD kids go to school, they got to know what Title IX means and the impact if there is a situation on college campus that they're involved in and how to manage that, right? So I think it'd be an amazing opportunity Wonderful. Okay. That's another thing we can add to, um, to the weekend agenda, everyone. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> A big topic of conversation is motivation. So we know that the ADHD brain is a now, not now brain. And college is not now for so many of our students, even if it's next year, even if it's two years from now. Um, and parents really struggling to get their child motivated to participate in the process. You and I discussed a little before the session, the idea of like, you know, the fact of the matter is a lot of these kids probably don't actually know what college feels like. And could that be a way of increasing their motivation is sort of introducing them to like the, the benefits beyond long-term career benefits, that stuff feels so far away. It's like basically ideas for motivating our kids who need something a little more immediate than like a good job, you know, six years from now. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I just relate to this, just being looking back and remembering how much it's, I think it's motivation. I will, I do wonder after all these years of me working with so many students with ADHD, I kind of have come to believe that it's not as much motivation as fear, anxiety, and procrastination, which is motive is not motivating when you're afraid and you're afraid you have to face, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm like all of those emotional things. What I think, what I have found is the as soon as students, even as young as freshmen and sophomore, understand the timeline, go to a college campus, take a look at what a co college application even looks like. Anyone can go on to common app and open an application so they can see what's required. It just feels like our society does not do a great job with all kids, but especially with ADHD, students in the college process of backwards planning and just sharing the smallest little things. And what we see is students feel so empowered once they have an idea of what it even is. And it's motivating and inspiring 
if they have something to look forward to. But I mean, listen, I'm a mom of four kids, for God's sakes. I mean, my kids often procrastinated and put things off to the, the very last minute. I also think that's where the parenting V comes in, is that sometimes I think as a parent, it is our job to sweep the path and to say, I know that if we don't get a handle on this, down the road, this is going to be problematic. This is the authority, you know, the three different kinds of parenting. There's the laissez-faire, I'm not going to do anything. There's the authoritarian, which is more the very bossy, clear, like no choice kind of parent. And then there's the authoritative, which is the authoritative is like, listen, I love you enough that we're going to do a couple walks around college. We're going to go meet with your college counselor. We're going to create a plan. And we're going to do this because I want to preserve your mental health through this process. Like going to a dentist is part of what we do in our family because we care about education. So there's, you know, easier said than done. And I get that. Okay. Um, you, you did mention um, anxiety and, and a number of parents here saying that, um, you know, they, they're, maybe they have a child who is motivated, but also um, feeling anxious. And they're wondering about ways that they can explore college in perhaps a less stressful way. So for example, um, do you have thoughts on enrolling as a part-time student, um, perhaps living at home for the first year or um, attending community college, any solutions that could be a, a bit of a bridge um, especially for those kids who are either, you know, working on their self-confidence, um, anxiety, and or, you know, academic and executive function skills. Yeah, I have a lot of opinions about about this one because it's a it's a balance. Obviously, it always it depends on the individual student. One thing I want to be careful with with the anxiety piece is sometimes we say, let's put it. Uh, let's 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 do something like community college or let's keep them at home for another year because again we're just procrastinating again and then we just extend the anxiety we extend the anxiety timeline so i want to be careful of that i also think it depends on the students kind of grades where they're applying if there's other things they need to do to pull up grades like obviously all of that i think a lot of parents talk about community college but community college is college and um and sometimes especially you know adhd kids are often very bright and they want to be engaged and they want to be social and they want to be so they want a piece of that college experience and most of my students aren't just getting all excited about living at home and going to community college just because they're wanting to be launched. Now, obviously, there's such a range and there's so many kids and so many stories. And there are times where it's appropriate to do that community college. What I have loved for many of these students is the idea of a gap placement. And a gap year means that they're out in the world, away from home, in a safe place with people who understand their accommodations, often can get college credit. It gives them an extra year for their brain to develop, but it also gives them practice to kind of build up that stamina with their anxiety, their motivation, their career interests. And we have seen a lot of success with those students. What I also like to do is to still apply to a few colleges and a gap so that they can defer in case they change their mind and decide in April of their senior year, you know what, maybe I am ready for college because I will tell you one thing that is unbelievable to me is how much those kids grow from the beginning of senior year to the end of senior year. It is a big growth time for them. So that holds that space for both options. Okay, that is that is great advice. Um, and goodness, for those um, who are looking at the gap year, are there sort of hallmarks of a successful gap experience. A lot of people here are writing in that like some of the biggest challenges they foresee with their kids are like 
getting up on time and going to sleep at a reasonable hour. And it seems like a gap would offer them the opportunity to begin practicing those skills. But of course, it feels risky. Like might, might they never go back to college? You know, what are some of the things we need to keep in mind as we're evaluating whether a gap might be right for our kids? I think that, I mean, again, that the checklist that I provided today feels obviously not every single one marked off, but the waking up on time is one of, I think it's like the second, one of the second things on, on there for me, because this being able to get to show up to the class is the most important. I remember I actually did this. My son, Christopher, when he went to college, I told him, I figured out how much each class cost. And I think it was like $550 a class to go to college. And I'm like, if you miss a class, like you're going to have to pay me back. I, I I remember saying something silly like that. I, I never followed through on it because he ended up going to class, which was a miracle to me. But, you know, there's that piece of like, have we possibly underestimated them? Is Do they have a sleep disorder or something that really is going to get in the way? And do they need accommodations? I've One of the things I've really loved, but this is an expensive option, is for students to maybe um, take their first semester to take not as many classes. So instead of taking five at CU Boulder, Christopher took four. He maybe even took, yeah, I think he took four and then he took a summer class. So that was a way to kind of break it up. Or sometimes we have to be like, is it possible my student will be in college for five years? Or will we be on, when we think about the colleges we apply to, will we make sure, but just, sorry, to go back to the question, I think, you know, there's certain things we need to know a student can do. And that one of them is going to be able to get up and get there because it's very expensive, these programs, right? But I also think for a gap year, some of them are self-motivating, like everybody's getting up because we're getting on a bus to go somewhere to do something. So you can't stay in bed for that. Mm -hmm. I love the, the creativity of breaking up the the classes the first year and using that summertime um, because also arguably structure, some continuity of structure during the summer will be helpful as you enter the next year of college. So um, that's a great idea as well. Um, I wanted to read a, a question here that I think applies to a lot of folks here. Um, someone wrote in to say that they struggle with the development of grit and drive the realization that decisions made and actions taken now um, in high school have a true effect on your future. Do you have any suggestions on how to imp best impress the importance of these trigger actions in high school um, for students, especially those with ADHD? <laughs> Oh, I really relate to that because I had, you know, I had kids that made some poor mistakes in middle school and high school that, you know, it, a lot of impulsivity and some behavior stuff that, you know, really did impact, you know, in a D and a geometry class that you then have to write about senior year and all of those things. It's just really hard. And Again, it depends on the situation because some of those things could be things we really need to pay attention to tackling those issues that come up around grit and drive. But ultimately, one of the hardest things about being a parent of a student with ADHD is sometimes we have to let go and that their path is their path. And unfortunately, that sometimes means they shut some doors for themselves because they made not great choices. And as parents, we have to let go of our own ego. We have to practice not comparing to others. And we have to have enough belief in our students and our children that their path will be a path that is what it is. I mean, that's, and it's really hard to do that. 
I think about that a lot when I look at some of these kids who come to me as juniors and they've, you know, they have a minor in possession, MIP, or they've been suspended because they did something really stupid. And, and those mistakes ultimately, I think, helped motivate and shift their behaviors over time, but not in enough time to put some of those colleges on the list they thought were going to be on their list. And so I think there is a little bit of like, of course, I can do grit scales with my student and I can hire mentors and coaches and, you know, we can do all of those things. But in the end, our students ultimately are teenagers who are making decisions that are going to have an impact. I think what I want those parents to know, the parent who wrote that question is, is that there is a path forward no matter what. There are thousands of colleges. There are tons of programs. There are There is your own family who will love and embrace your student no matter what, even through those mistakes. I think that is a wonderful way to end today's session. I wish we had more time, but Laura, thank you so much for joining us today and for contributing all of these really helpful resources to our community. I will stress once more that you, everyone listening and everyone who registered in advance will receive all of the resources, including the slides and um, all of those that Laura provided via QR code. So, um, so worry not, <laughs> um, they're all coming your way. And thank you to everyone who did join us today. If you want to access any more event resources, um, beyond what you receive in the follow-up email, you will visit attitudemag.com and search for podcast 498. You're going to find the slides and the recording after the event. And I will say that our team will put together a few additional resources on gap years because there was a lot of interest in that in the Q&A right toward the end. So we will provide what we have and then maybe we can... Um, entice Laura to come back and talk to us more just about the gap program. So, um, the I'd full, that. yes, oh, a lot of people wondering about this as an option. Um, and of course you can, um, access the full library of attitude webinars at any time in, in our podcast. And it's called the ADHD experts podcast. It's available on all your streaming platforms. We hope everyone can join us again for another free webinar next week. We are going to be talking about ADHD in older adults with Dr. David Goodman. Um, if you want to make sure that you don't miss any future Attitude webinars or articles or research updates, you can sign up for free alerts at attitudemag.com slash newsletters. Laura, thank you again for your time, expertise, and resources today. And thanks to everybody who joined us and listened in. Thank you so much.